happy Friday. Welcome back to Matt Flex and Chill. This is Rachel Gregory, your host, and we have a solo Q&A episode for you today. Before we jump into the questions, quick shout out to our sponsor for all Friday episodes for the month of October, Keto Brick. If you haven't checked out Keto Brick yet, you can go to ketobrick.com and you can actually use the code METFLEXLIFE when you purchase and you'll be entered to win a free month supply of Keto Bricks. I will link that in the show notes for you to check out. I'll also link that code. Again, it's METFLEXLIFE. All right, let's jump into the questions for today. All right, first question today. I hear you talk about calorie cycling a lot and it's got me wondering about something. Would it be possible to minimize weight gain during a muscle building phase if you ate at a surplus on lifting days but ate at a deficit on recovery days if you're following a three to four times per week lifting routine? I've heard bodybuilders using intermittent fasting to help mitigate some of the weight gain during a bulk, so now I'm curious if calorie cycling could be put to similar use. Thanks again for all the great info. All right, great question. Um, So first of all, calorie cycling in simplest terms, it's basically just cycling your calories in different ways throughout the week. Um, And you can even do this throughout multiple weeks or even uh, like multiple months. So the biggest thing to remember is that our calories don't reset overnight, right? I talk about this all the time and this is um, something that I got tripped up about a lot uh, before I, you know, got into nutrition when I was going through, you know, in high school when I was yo-yo dieting and trying to, you know, lose weight and I gain it back and all that jazz. But in my head, I thought, okay, calories, you know, they reset overnight, right? So if I, you know, consume a certain amount today, I'll wake up the next morning and I'll just have a clean slate. Well, we know it doesn't work like that. So if we can look at our calories on a weekly basis, that is what's important um, because it's the overall caloric, it's, it's our overall caloric intake over the week that matters most, not the daily intake. And that's the same with, you know, I talk about the scale all the time and how you shouldn't be looking at the daily fluctuations in the scale because there's so many different factors that go into that fluctuation. And that's why with myself and with all my clients, we look at your weekly average um, fluctuations with the scale, or sorry, your weekly average scale weight and use that as our, um, as our number to look at and base that off of trends and adjust from there. We don't adjust off of any daily intake. Okay, now I'm just getting off track. So with calorie cycling, basically you can do this in so many different ways um, and it would just be compared to a linear intake. So a linear intake is really you're just consuming the same amount of calories seven days a week, same amount of macros seven days a week. With calorie cycling, you can implement so many different strategies. Um, One of the most common strategies that I implement with both myself and my clients is a 5-2 split. So that would be, you know, five days of a specific intake with your calories and your macros and then two days of another intake. Um, Usually we implement this in a fat loss phase. So if you're doing, you know, five days in a deficit, two days at a refeed, and usually those two days are on the weekend when most people eat more. Um, So that's a really good adherence tool. And that's what I would say calorie cycling is. Um, It's not, there's no magic behind it. Again, if we're looking at your weekly caloric intake, as long as you come out at the end of the week to the caloric intake that you are um, targeting, then that's what's important. How you cycle your calories during the week really doesn't matter. As long as by the end of the week, you come out to where you're supposed to be, that's what matters. Um, So you could do, you know, a 5-2 split, a 6-1 split. You could implement fasting. So fasting is a type of calorie cycling in itself, especially if you're doing, you know, like alternate day fasting or really any type of fasting. Um, With a lot of my clients, we use PSMF days, which are protein sparing modified fast days where you bring your calories down very low for one day of the week and you just focus on protein. That is a type of calorie cycling Then we also have carb cycling, which is just cycling your carbs throughout the week in different, you know, ways. And then related to this question, you can cycle your calories based off of your workout days and your non-workout days, right? So there's so many different ways to go about it. How I use calorie cycling for myself and for my clients is mostly when we're in a fat loss phase. So I don't usually recommend calorie cycling at maintenance or if you are in a building phase or muscle building phase, just because we know that, you know, during a building phase, you really, and even at maintenance, you really don't want to be in a deficit 
at all, right? Because you want to continue sending those anabolic signals to your body to constantly grow or maintain, right? So for me, I don't usually practice or recommend calorie cycling in a building phase unless you absolutely can adhere to like a linear intake or you just know that, you know, maybe you feel better cycling on and off throughout the week, right? Maybe, for example, like you mentioned, on your workout days, maybe you have higher calories and then on your non-workout days, maybe you have, um, you know, a little bit lower calories if that works for you. But again, if you're in, you know, a building phase, the more that you can be out of that deficit, right, on a consistent basis, the better off it's probably going to be in the long run. Because again, you're just sending the right signals to your body to say, okay, I'm not in a deficit. I'm not, I don't have any scarcity in terms of energy coming in. I'm just looking to build or even maintain. And that's the goal right now. So with that being said, you can implement, you know, carb cycling throughout the week, which would look like, for example, I'm actually doing this with one of my clients. So she has, she's been in a building phase for about five weeks now, and we have her doing um, five targeted keto days. So she likes to follow a ketogenic low carb diet. Um, She feels good that way, um, but she's also looking to build muscle and perform at her, you know, optimal potential. Um, So we have her doing five targeted keto days where she is, um, at about 70 grams of carbs on those five days, 70 grams of total carbs, and she's putting most of those carbs around her workouts. And then two days of the week, she has two higher carb days. So we're bumping her carbs up a lot um, and bringing her fats down. But overall, she is still consuming the same amount of calories every single day. So, or just about the same amount of calories. So she's actually not calorie cycling, but she is carb cycling because that's what she feels best at, right? So, you know, again, there's no magic to calorie cycling or even carb cycling in terms of mitigating weight gain. It's just an adherence tool for what you, you know, personally do best with. And I, I would say, again, if you're looking to build as much muscle as possible, you want to be out of that deficit on a consistent basis. So I wouldn't recommend personally, you know, cycling in calories, you know, on your workout days or rest days, unless that's the only way that you can adhere to that. Um, Or if you feel, you know, absolutely better at that. Another thing to realize too is that, and this is for, you know, whatever phase you're in, but if you are, say, you know, consuming less calories on your recovery days, then you have to consider how you're going to feel the next day, right? So if you're consuming less calories today, but you know that you have a hard workout tomorrow, are you going to be fueled enough for your workout tomorrow, especially if you're working out in the morning, right? So those are things you have to think about. Again, we can't look at things on just a daily basis. It really, you really have to look at, you know, what's going on throughout the entire week. Wow, I'm losing my voice. (laughs) So you really have to look at what's happening over the course of the week and not just on a daily basis. So if you can do that, and if you can get into the mindset of looking at your overall week, um, you'll start to see how things play out a little bit clearer um, in that sense. So hopefully that answered your question. All right, next question. How to lose weight with adrenal fatigue, especially adrenal insufficiency? Okay, so what is adrenal fatigue? So the basic definition of adrenal fatigue is it's just a group of related signs and symptoms that results when the adrenal glands function below necessary level. And it's usually associated with intense stress and often follows like a chronic infection or sickness, something like, you know, the flu, pneumonia, bronchitis, things like that. And the theory behind adrenal fatigue is that your body's immune system basically responds to this stress by revving up like your your entire system, right? Your entire nervous system begins to rev up. Your adrenal glands, which are the small organs above your kidneys, they respond to this stress by releasing hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. So these hormones are part of what we call our flight or fight response, which is just our sympathetic nervous system. And they increase, when these hormones are released, they increase blood pressure, heart rate, and again, put you in that sympathetic state. So the sympathetic nervous system is our fight or flight mode, and our parasympathetic uh, system is our rest and digest mode. We talk about that a lot on this podcast. So, you know, according to this theory, if you have long-term stress, 
your adrenal glands can quote unquote burn out from prolonged production of cortisol, prolonged production of these hormones um, that, you know, are, they're not bad hormones, right? Like cortisol is not a bad hormone. Adrenal is not a bad hormone. Um, It's just when they are elevated chronically, that's probably not a good situation. Um, And that's when adrenal fatigue can set in. So there's actually no like straightforward lab test to actually test if you have adrenal fatigue, but there is a medical term known as adrenal insufficiency, which was part of this question. And that refers to inadequate production of one or more of the hormones that I just mentioned. And actually adrenal insufficiency, insufficiency can be diagnosed by blood tests and also these like special stimulation tests that can show um, inadequate levels of adrenal hormones. So that's the difference between, you know, adrenal fatigue and adrenal insufficiency if you've never heard those terms before. Some of the signs and symptoms of adrenal insufficiency would be, the first one would be fatigue, obviously. Um, A few other ones are body aches, um, unexplained weight loss or weight gain, low blood pressure, lightheadedness, loss of body hair, uh, skin discoloration. Those are just a few of the the kind of most common. Um, But to answer your question, how to lose weight with adrenal fatigue. So based on everything I just said, the biggest thing that you need to focus on is stress reduction, right? So you need to find ways that you can personally manage your stress, whatever that is. So this is like something that I work on a lot with my clients. And this is, you know, One of the biggest things that a lot of people tend to forget about just in general when it comes to setting goals, especially if they're fat loss goals, stress is such a huge part of it. And if you can't manage your stress and all the things that, you know, come with that, then you're going to be, you're going to have a really hard time reaching any goal, especially fat loss goals. So that's the biggest thing, reducing stress. And, and I know it's, you know, it's easier said than done, but finding specific ways to reduce this stress and, um, you know, setting different uh, parameters in the regards of exercise, sleep, right? So sh- we have this stress bucket, right? I, call, I, I talk about this all the time. You have a stress bucket and if you fill it up too much, it's going to overflow. And our body doesn't know the difference between different stressors. Like our body doesn't really know the difference between exercise. Exercise is a stress. It doesn't know the difference between Um, the stress of not sleeping enough, the stress of, you know, the work we are sorry, like at work or at home or whatever it is, all of these things that are happening in terms of stress in our modern world, which there are a lot of, they all contribute to our overall allostatic load, which is just our overall stress load. And if these, if we're constantly, you know, adding to this quote unquote stress bucket, and we're not finding ways to help reduce stress in general, then it's not going to be a good situation. So the first thing that I would think about is, you know, audit yourself, right? Audit your life, right? Figure out the, the areas of your life where you have the most stress. Are you exercising too much? Are you doing too much high intensity exercise? Are you, have you been dieting for, you know, longer than you can remember like so have you been in a deficit for more than you can remember um are you not sleeping are you stressed out at work or stressed out at home are you in a pandemic (laughs) Um, i'm pretty sure all of us are right now um these are all stressors so this is the biggest thing and this is the biggest thing i work on with my clients is we track all of these things so we call them biofeedback metrics so we're tracking you know sleep stress recovery, um, workouts, we're tracking, you know, even with a lot of my clients, I have them actually tracking their daily stress relief routines. So whether that includes some meditation, some journaling, um, even if it's like taking a bath, you know, every night to de-stress, maybe it's, you know, watching their favorite TV show or whatever it is that helps you to de-stress, that's what you need to do. So the biggest thing I would say is just audit your life first, sit down, you know, take some time and write down all of the areas that you have potential stress in and figure out how you can start to reduce that. Once you do that, you'll be very, very surprised with what can happen. Um, So yeah, that's the biggest thing that I would say um, in relation to this question, how to lose weight with adrenal fatigue. You have to find ways to reduce that stress. Also, I would say if you know you're definitely suffering from like adrenal insufficiency, 
then it's probably not a good time to diet or be in a deficit until you can take care of these stressors first. Um, so, you know, get out of that sympathetic state. The more you can get into that parasympathetic rest and digest mode throughout the day, the better off you're going to be. The more you can reduce your stress, the better off you're going to be going into a fat loss phase in the future. So I just think about that. Um, so yeah, that's my advice for how to lose weight with adrenal fatigue. All right, last question today. How do you go about setting weekly and or monthly goals for yourself so you don't go crazy trying to do it all? Okay, great question. Um, so first of all, I'm going to kind of go over how I set goals in general, um, and then I'll dive into how I set or how I break them down into like daily, weekly, monthly, and even yearly goals. So the first thing we have to think about are the different types of goals, right? And how you're setting those goals. So I like to look at them as having outcome versus behavior goals. So outcome goals are obviously something that you want to happen. That is the outcome, right? <laughs> you want it to happen. So things like, you know, an outcome goal could be losing weight or building muscle or being less stressed or sleeping more, things like that. The behavior goals are the action you do or practice to work towards that outcome. So for example, if you want to lose weight, what is the behavior that you need to do consistently to be able to lose weight? So maybe it's you track macros and calories consistently. Maybe you need to meal prep for the week, you know, consistently. Um, consistency is a very, very important term, which I'm going to talk about in a second um, when it comes to any goal. But anyway, that's kind of a different subject. So yeah, that would be behavior goals. Um, for example, if you want to build muscle, maybe you need to make sure that you are consistently lifting weights three or more times a week. If you want to be less stressed, less stressed, maybe you need to practice meditation on a daily basis or journal. Um, if you want to sleep better, maybe you need to follow a nighttime routine or implement a routine at night that helps you wind down to be able to sleep better. So there's nothing wrong with outcome goals, but oftentimes there are things that we can't actually directly control. Behavior goals, on the other hand, allow us to focus on and take action on the things that we can control. So rather than focusing on the outcome, you want to focus on and also track the behaviors and practices that will lead to that outcome. So this is exactly what I do for myself and with my one-on-one -on -one clients. We implement and track daily practices that will get them closer to their desired outcome. Um, and if you're interested in applying for one-on-one -on -one coaching, I will link that link in the show notes, or you can just go to metflexlife.com backslash apply. You can apply for one-on-one -on -one coaching and dive into all this stuff um, for you personally, along with me, you know, guiding you along the way and helping you to um, set outcome goals and behavior goals. So anyway, back to your question. How do you go about setting weekly and or monthly goals for yourself so you don't go crazy trying to do it all? So the first thing to start with is asking yourself two questions. The first question, who do I want to be one year from now? And the second question, what habits and consistent behaviors does that person have? So once you are able to take some time and not just like five minutes, but maybe like 20 minutes to actually sit down and think about this, it's going to become a lot easier to actually set goals that are really in line with what you truly want to achieve and the person that you actually, you know, want to become in a year from now, right? So I like to set 90 day goals or three month, three month goals in four different areas after thinking about this question or these two questions. And this is something that I do with my coach. And then I also do this, do this with my clients. So the four different areas are, the first one is body. So that would be, you know, in relation to your body composition or maybe some something performance related. A lot of the clients I work with all have some type of body composition or some type of performance goal. So that would be the first one. The second category would be mindset. The third category would be relationships, and this could be relationships with others. So maybe like your significant other, a friend, family member, or it could be, you know, relationship with yourself. Um, and then the fourth category would be business or work. And again, this is something I've done with my coach and I do it with my clients. We basically establish exactly what behaviors and actions need to happen weekly and daily to reach these desired outcomes or goals. And then we establish a system to hold you accountable to hitting your weekly and 90 day targets. 
So when you're setting these goals for each particular category, again, their body, mindset, relationships, and business or work, you'll want to answer the following questions for each category. And this will help you break down the goal and break down the outcome, but also the behaviors that have to occur in order to reach that outcome, right? So the first question is, what is your desired outcome in the next 90 days? The second question, why is this your desired outcome? The third question, How will you track and measure your progress towards this outcome? And the fourth question, how will achieving this outcome change you? Okay, so let's go through a quick example in relation to a mindset goal. Um, So I'm going to bring you through actually my first um, mindset goal that I set probably over a year ago with my coach, and I answered these questions. So the first question, what is your desired outcome in the next 90 days? Mine was to stick with a consistent morning routine. So that's the outcome that I wanted to achieve. Why is this your desired outcome? So I know that when I start my morning focused on how to make myself better, my entire day becomes more productive and just better overall. Um, And the third question, how will you track and measure your progress towards this outcome, right? Because we need to track these actions and behaviors in order to achieve the outcome. And so I set specific actions or daily actions with my coach that he holds me accountable with or held me accountable for and actually still does hold me accountable for on a daily basis. So for me, it was starting off with meditating, you know, X times per week. I think I started like three times per week and then worked my way up to seven times per week at, um, I think I started off at like five minutes, worked my way up to 10 minutes. So that was a specific daily action. On top of that, we added in journaling like X times per week and then some some other uh, morning routine uh, things within that. And they just kind of built on each other. So that was the third question. And the fourth question, how will achieving this outcome change you? Having a consistent morning routine for me will allow me to bring my best self to everything I do throughout the day. Um, my best self to my family, my work, my friends, everything during the day. And I've realized that, right, as I've been able to consistently have a morning routine and focus on what makes me the best version of myself, it allows me to bring my best self to everything I do throughout the day. So that's just an example of like how you can break down a mindset goal. But you want to remember that these are your goals, right? That's just an example that I gave you. You want to base these on what you want to accomplish in the next 90 days. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks. They're your goals. And the reason that, you know, we pick 90 days is because that's a long enough time to get you to create actions that become habits and behaviors that become daily habits to allow you to actually achieve and follow through with the outcome that you would want to reach. So that is how I break down um, my daily, weekly, and I guess monthly and even yearly goals. So hopefully that helps a little bit and um, gives you some action items to to work on. All right, that's all the questions we have for today's Q&A. Another big shout out to our sponsor for all solo episodes for the month of October, Keto Brick. Head over to ketobrick.com and use the code METFLEXLIFE when you purchase and you'll be entered to win a free month supply of Keto Bricks. And as always, if you're enjoying this podcast, the best way to help it grow is to share it with your friends and family. And also, if you are on Instagram, you can take a screenshot of the episode as you're listening to it post it to your Instagram story and tag me at rachelgregory.cns and that will help spread the word about the show, get people interested. I'll reshare it. I'll thank you for listening. And yeah, that's all I got for you today. I'll be back with another Q&A next week and hopefully for many, many weeks to come. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you have a fantastic weekend.